Anyway, the certificate is, uh, as you can see, 30 credits, so it's year one. Students can take uh, any combination of courses. There's no set uh, prerequisite at all. Uh, there are some requirements, however, that is 50% of those credits, in other words, 15 credits, can come in through PLAR um, or applied, um, applied studies or studio vocational level, that sort of thing. But the other 15 credits need to come in as transfer credit because a student needs to establish a 2.0 minimum GPA. Right? This is an important factor for this group because if you look at the list of the proposed courses, many of those proposed courses are coming in, would transfer into TRU through CLEP. CLEP comes into us as the CLAR, and CLAR does not, does not affect your GPA. CLAR, CLAR credits can, can qualify as residential credits, but they cannot correct the GPA. Sorry, what are the acronyms Sorry. The acronyms? Fire learning. Fire learning assessment. Fire learning. Fire learning. Fire learning. Fire learning. Fire learning. Fire is is there are the exam, standardized exams that students write um, for credential, for credits in the city. So it's college level exam, yeah. examination preparation, automated assessment. Yeah. It's linked from the agenda. So I, I just, you know, that's that's something that we need to keep in mind as we're working on our transfer and articulation agreements. We need to be aware that for a student to achieve the outcome of a certificate, which a student <coughs> who enters into our program, I I would say some would like to see, well, what's the end result? What do I get out of this? If I take 10 courses. What will I get? Well, we're saying you need one of the things you can be credentialed with is the certificate. However, the certificate does have these requirements, right? So minimum, minimum 2.0 GPA, which has to be established through transfer credit, cannot be established through PLAR transfer, the PLAR review, right? So that's that's just an important thing to keep in, keep in front of us. Um, yes? What's PLAR? Prior learning assessment. Okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> And okay, so the um, this is an arts program, so it comes to the Faculty of Arts, which is one of the programs that I adjudicate. Uh, we do, however, accept credits from uh, courses that are taken within other disciplines, such as education, business, administrative studies. Now, what's up here? It says those courses are reviewed on a case by case basis, which is true. Um, they, for the most part. Many of the courses are all have already been articulated through our robust articulation system that we already have at British Columbia. So I would uh, I would say that if we look at our list of proposed courses, one of my goals would be that we pre-articulate. In other words, we adjudicate these courses now or over the next six months. That to me that needs to be a priority. And those of us who provide academic oversight for this kind of adjudication need to be involved in that so that when I get at the other end of this whole process two three years down the road or maybe even sooner a student come presents their, their case to me and says I've completed 10 courses I'm bringing in five through PLAR and I've done the two TRU courses and here's my three other courses which I'm transferring from this this and this institute I'm going to say okay show us the transcripts they're going to have to send us those transcripts from whatever university they've taken that course in. And then in our system, we'll already have built that articulation agreement. So as soon as that our program advisors plug in the information, our system, which is called DegreeWorks, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, will automatically recognize, oh yes, we already have approved articulation agreement with that course, whether it's New Zealand or, or wherever. Right? So that's, that's my ultimate goal here, is to make transfers seamless and easy for our students. So they don't have to fight that battle when they want to get that credential. Um, you know, at TRU, we're quite excited about the fact that we are offering this credential as one of the outcomes for a student completing 10 courses. And once they become a TRU student and we, uh, we give them that credential, there's a possibility, of course, where we, we actually maintain a very, again, a very robust communication system with our students, where they would get a communication following that saying, if 
you want to continue in a and ladder that into a diploma or into our Bachelor of General Studies, it's going to be a very easy fix. It's going to be a very easy move for that student to further their education if they choose to, right? Um, I mean, ultimately, I would love to see this whole program expand to offer not only one year, but two years, or maybe even ladder into a full degree at some point down the road. Right? That's my own aspiration. Um, here. So I've got some links. Is that working? Yes. So the link that I have here is the Institute Articulation System. <clears throat> so basically, as I've said before, we have a, a very uh, comprehensive articulation uh, system already in place for most, for all of BC and now in Alberta. Um, and it's, we're actually we articulate courses. Uh, from all over the world. We're quite used to that. We have a high number of international students at CRU. So we have, for the most part, articulated many, in many, many, many instances. And once that information is in our system, it stays there. So one student coming from uh, Mumbai who brings in his or her degrees, it's, it's articulated, it's transfer credit, it's brought in. They might, they might achieve 60 credits or 90 credits towards a degree at TRU. Now that's in our system. The next time that student, another student comes with the same, it's, it's done, right? So we don't do it on a case-by-case -case basis. We have it all integrated into our system. So my goal here would be to have that same well, transfer information in our system so that it's a seamless transfer. Um, and right, you know, and sort of build that capacity, as I said here, to articulate and transfer any and all international courses credits. So one of the, the cautions, I, however, um, in talking to our transfer credit team uh, <coughs> last week, um, was that they alerted me to the fact that there are a lot of, not a lot, I guess there are, they've identified a list, they only have been, they could keep adding to that list, of universities that don't issue transcripts for course takers. So we have to be aware of that. So that would be another thing we need to make sure that we have that agreement amongst our partners that you know you're all you're offering one or two courses, or you're offering two courses, a student only takes one course from your institution, are you going to give us or submit or the student requests um, a formal transcript? Will they get that? Because in order for them to get the transfer credit at TRU, we need to see a transcript. All right. Otherwise, if a student doesn't get a transcript, then they'll have to um, request PLAR. All right. And that's, that's can, that can happen. That's, I'm not saying that that's off the table, but PLAR doesn't establish your GPA. Right? So just think of the big picture. So 15 credits of the 30 credits can be PLAR, can be applied studies, etc. Of the rest, the other 15 credits for TRU, um, six of those credits have to be TRU courses. So the other three can come from individual universities. Of those other three, we're going to need transcripts. Okay? Is that any questions? Just a clarification. Yeah. So, so it is possible after a, a review process for the business courses to articulate in the certificate, assuming you know, that they meet the requirements? That's not going to be a barrier. No, but that's why I want to pre-articulate. Yeah. And, and yeah. would that require a bilateral uh, agreement? And it's a letter or just that you get that that's in place? Just all, yeah. It's all done systematically. <coughs> where we have a, a really professional FLAR team. We have a professional credit transfer team. I would work with them to engage, to make sure, <coughs> and I as well. We would both make sure that that's all in our system. Irvin, you can jump in here. If there's anything I'm forgetting. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's I don't know if I do six minutes, but <laughs> this, it's really essential. I just think that we get our heads around the fact that, you know, as much as we're trying to make this open and engaging and engaging with the world, should a student wish to follow through and actually want those credits, want the transcript, and they want the certificate, then there's going to have to be some hoops they have to jump through. And, but we as institutions can make that that leap a lot easier if we already pre-approve all these courses. Now, for me, I'm, I would require, the first step is I need to see course outlines. Um, so we, we ought to have a standardized form for course outline information. That's pretty easy. To, I could come up with a template in five minutes. Um, and then we have that conversation. If I need to dig a bit deeper, I can dig a little bit deeper, but I would work with a 
contact at that university and say, you know, and then I'm, and from our end, we're going to look for course for course transfer. I, because there's a lot of those courses that I'm seeing, uh, we, we offer at TRU, so I could equate that to BBuzz or, you know, whatever our acronym is, it could be different from your acronym. But we could do course for course transfer so that there's an equal transfer, or we would just say unassigned credit um, for a business course coming from somewhere. Um, but that's not an issue. Unassigned credit or course for course doesn't matter to me as long as I see the credits on a transcript. And because some of our, you know, we have different values sometimes for courses, as you said the other day, we, our degrees are 120 hours. Others are different, so sometimes our courses are three credits. Yeah, you know that's that's our system. So and we're quite used to again articulating courses from around the world and transferring something that's a four credit course, of course, into a three credit course. We're quite quite used to that. Yeah. I thank you very much, Ben. That's extremely okay. useful, and in the session which follows, we can actually then start dropping down those action points uh, into the things that we need to get done. Uh, for the system to work. I'd like to invite uh, Andy to fill us in on the CERT AG here at CERT <coughs> So that means we can know a month before 
are an example to say how many students we've got, how many staff we need to mark the work. Um, then one of our problems is obviously this involves a lot of writing, so it's, it's essays, presentations. So the students will have to meet our English language requirements. And we have those on our websites. Um, it's basically a, a Cambridge English behind um, the LTS, the kind of standard English requirements. And I'd like to know how the other partners are doing that as well, because I see you would also have standard English requirements. I wondered, I, I wondered if we couldn't offer something that we would intersect through OERU, English exactly. Um, would that be possible? Mm -hmm. The Martians have landed. Let's <laughs> <laughs> see. <seems> <laughs> <Okay. laughs> right. um, yeah. So essentially, when a student has got um, R60 credits and the equivalent of 60 OERU credits, um, they would then be able to offer um, that they'd be able to ask us to award the OERU CSHG. Um, so there would be another registration process where they would say, this is our evidence, so obviously we would have the evidence for our side, but we would require evidence from the other partners that they had successfully completed um, the, the required work and that the partners were convinced that the students had done their work. So once that had happened, they would be asked to register to accept the award and uh, there would be a registration fee involved in that as well to take the there. What's happening at the moment is we're putting it through our processes. We've got a variety of um, forms that have to be filled out, which I have sent to um, Wayne. So that could be the basis of the forms that we were speaking about because we've already started that process with some very ideal partners. They're quite long and extensive, so we might want to cut them down a little bit. You're talking about course, course outlines? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> we just need the basics. Well, I can show you what we've got, and you can choose what you would like from it. So we've already got it for some of the courses which are in the certain sheet. And some of the others have as well, because we have to go through right. the processes too. We're all going to have to share it. Yeah. 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 We, we, we will have a, a pop space. And the wiki and we will share this properly, yeah. So the, the schedule for this is uh, we hope to have the whole course um, through our approval system by the end of this year. Um, I'm busy writing the three courses, I'm converting them from our current courses, which are um, which consist of some online material, but some of face-to-face teaching as well. And I'm also um, looking for open source materials because currently all three courses have recommended textbooks which our libraries have, but the students want to be able to access them. So there's a fair amount of work to be done there to uh, turn the courses into fully open courses, but once that's been done, they will articulate with our current offering. Because we don't know if we, we would have students from Scotland taking one of these courses <coughs> or from England, so they could easily do that and then they can arrive and continue the rest of the course with us. So that's an important part of this process, is that these modules articulate in our current provision. So they can come in at any time. They either come in in the first year, they complete the first year here, or they come in into the second year once they've got the certification business. So that's, that's the plans at the moment, and hopefully that will all be approved by faculty at the end of the, by the, end of the year. The courses we will offer and assessment will be available as soon as the courses are ready to go and it's all for faculty. So that should be there sometime next year. The final deadline for the whole thing is December 2017. But I hope to have at least one course up and running um, in the new year. And my understanding is once if the cert HE has been validated, you can actually start offering the courses that are complete. In other words, you don't have to wait for completion of all the yeah, courses. That's what I was saying. Yeah, one yeah. course. Um, up in the beginning of the next year, and all the courses that, that you're uh, developing as well, as soon as they're online. The, the thing that we need to wait for is the validation process. The minute that's through, we can start offering courses. We just have to be really careful that students understand that we don't have the entire course ready Absolutely. yet. So they can't expect to do everything by June and get a certificate. That's not going to happen. 
and hopefully by the end of December next year, we'll have everything and uh, we start awarding certificates. We're keeping the, the fees down, but um, the way the university works is we will be employing lecturers from our partners to do the market. So that's where the money is going to go, um, because we don't employ any staff who are able to mark these courses. They all come from other colleges. But I've had discussions with two of our biggest partners, and they're very keen to get involved in this. So, Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, and Andy. Also, thanks for all your hard work behind behind the scenes on that. It's a lot of work that goes into you know developing these processes and documentation. And the, the process is going well. Right. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I want to say that I don't know a lot about this pilot. But it has been prepared by the Associate Vice President of um, Student and Academic Services and the Registrar. The pilot um, uh, using Proctor U as the remote invigilation technology uh, was started in the spring and we just received our first results. And so I have some notes and I um, look forward to hearing your questions. Currently at Athabasca University, we do about 3,000 exams a month. Um, these are 54% paper-based. We have some online through Much Learning, which is a technology in Alberta grown uh, online technology, and some others through the IBM Notes platform, which is what we use in our uh, graduate programs in the business, um, in, the, in the faculty of business. Um, currently, it doesn't cost students anything to have their exams invigilated if they do it in person at one of our learning centers however in that in Alberta however they do have to pay for uh, invigilators um, throughout the invigilation network at colleges or universities or schools in other provinces or countries um, students can identify if they're in small communities they can identify invigilators according to a set of criteria um, and they uh, and they do that if they're in a small community with other so why do we want to do remote invigilation? Lots of reasons, mostly because it reduces costs for students, it reduces costs and operational uh, requirements for the university, and in the case of the U.S., it actually allows us to serve students in various states who, when we organize um, an invigilated exam that constitutes um, a physical presence in that particular state. And um, that is a problem for us as states are closing their doors to non-US based educational institutions. A typical uh, external invigilation can cost up to $200, which is uh, substantial for some of our students, those particularly working parents, um, there are parking and transportation costs, there are childcare costs, there are um, all the other costs that don't come with doing a distance online program like clothing where you have to get dressed and you have to, you have to go to a particular place. All of those things that our students can avoid 
um, they would have to still put in place for an exam. So the increased flexibility reduces stress and uh, students anyway think that they do better on their exams when their stress is reduced. I think we agree with that. Um, the management of our invigilation network is really time consuming and um, at, at Alaska we have uh, a number of jobs that are entry level jobs into the university where people come in, learn the job, and then they move into a different higher level position. And this one would be one of those lower level positions. So keeping continuity and consistency in the invigilation world is, is also really important. Um, students are particularly thankful, we found, with remote invigilation, those who have children. So what did we do first? We um, had the registrar's office do as much as they could do to test and break the technology, to cheat, to um, uh, ensure the reliability of the technology. ProctorU has a fairly wide network across Canada and the U.S. already, but uh, we really wanted to break it on our own terms and, and therefore did so. Um, Except we weren't as successful breaking it as we thought we would be. The um, technology has, has uh, been as reliable as we think we need it to be. Um, the cheating team had a great deal of fun trying to sneak into the room, trying to break the concentration <laughs> of the uh, visualator, trying to uh, help the student. And, um, and really, the technology prevents a lot of that. The uh, team was basically satisfied with this. A working group was composed of academics representative across the, the university, all faculties, representatives from exam services, the registrar and the administrative unit, students with disabilities, for example, this is a particular use of technology for our students with disabilities. Athabasca has a higher proportion of students with disabilities than just about any other um, institution within the province of Alberta and likely others across the country as well. The privacy coordinator was also involved in this. Undergraduate students were involved. At this point, we're just using this for undergraduate exams. Um, the other technology that was considered was something called Software Secure. You may be familiar with it. The problem is it's not live invigilation. What happens is the people at Software Secure um, review the tapes, essentially, of an exam, which is not what we were looking for at all. Um, the registrar, upon the choice of this technology, uh, the registrar traveled to all faculty council meetings, explained the service, answered questions, and helped um, or, or elicited questions for the evaluation surveys so that we would have good uh, representative academic opinion. The uh, pilot process was planned um, as a gradual implementation. Um, Initial communication went to students and to faculty and tutors so that everybody had all the same information. Uh, there were a few small issues. One um, had to do with the way information was provided to the uh, company that caused some confusion, but the communication was all worked out. And, and by starting very small, we were able to address most of those issues quite quickly. These are the concerns that we identified um, uh, through the pilot. Loss of internet service, whether this is intentional or not, there was a fear that students could cause the internet connection to be dropped, review their notes, and then come back and, re and start the exam again. Um, we don't think that this is very likely. Um, but the, the technology has a possibility of terminating exam, an exam if something looks fishy. And the um, representatives of the, uh, of the company are very talented and proficient in reading body language and a number of other things, so we're not as concerned about that. Monitoring the desktop space and using <coughs> approved materials we think is more likely. Cheating is cheating. It happens everywhere. Um, the proctoring method uh, is basically a, a video camera on the forehead to chin area, uh, but they read eye movements and so on as well. And so it's 
it's, um, <laughs> it seems clear that when a, when a student is working on the side of their desk or, or referring to other materials, that that's visible to the proctor and the proctor can terminate the exam in any, any case of suspicion. Um, they're good at detecting these issues. They do these environmental scans. They can take over the desktop. They can take over the mouse and the keyboard if there's any question or any suspicion. So uh, what we're trying to do with our students is, is talk to them about academic integrity so that they understand that this is, this is a real legitimate test of their knowledge and that they shouldn't be writing the exam. Remember that students get to choose the time of their exam. So they shouldn't be writing it if they're not ready for it. So we're trying to work on the positive side. Uh, the bathroom break issue is the same exam uh, bathroom break issue that you would have in any kind of environment. And we don't think that this is any, like, any more likely to be a cheating uh, opportunity than in any other context. Um, it's not really different. What we do get from the technology is the exact times of absence from the exam and it can also be um, analyzed afterwards if there is some sudden inspiration that arrives after somebody <laughs> comes back from a bathroom break. Honestly, maybe that would happen anyway, but um, I don't think we're, we want to worry too much about that too much. So the technology itself is a computer with a standard webcam, microphone, internet connectivity is required. Um, the students just schedule this exam the same as they would schedule any exam, um, there's, a, there's a chat window, an ongoing chat throughout the process, um, and incident reports are provided in cases of concern, detailed records, and um, reporting of the, of the session. So we have uh, certain standards with respect to marking times on exams. This 30-day um, window is much longer than the sort of uh, standard would be, which is only a few days for marking. So if there's any irregularities, it would be um, visible right away. So the early pilot from the spring, um, we did 101 <coughs> exams. Proctor Yu did um, a survey. We, we did a survey as well of students, but our students actually answered the Proctor Yu survey first. And then it didn't, the, the response rate was quite low for our own survey. We decided since that we don't need to ask the questions in front of you. Um, questions are adequate for our needs. While we had mostly Canadian exam takers, there were some in other parts of the world. And this is actually a place where we would like to explore much further. So we do have some data already on international exams. Um, you can see the numbers here that the students are um, pretty much agreed that the company uh, services were, um, were positive, were uh, acceptable, or were satisfactory, that the proctor service was satisfactory as well. Um, don't know what the disagree or mediocre are, um, but these results would be conflated with people who didn't do well in the exam. Right? Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, these are these are good good reviews. Is this before or after they get their marks? Uh, no, this is immediately <laughs> after they get the test. So, so they haven't got their marks. They or? haven't got their marks, but you know they you usually know in yeah. the exam whether you've done all right or not, right? Yeah. Yeah. And if you haven't done well, then you're going to be feeling. We're not that concerned about this level of uh, disagreement, although we will explore that further with more people. Remember, this is only 101 people. I think Since, you'd be concerned if there wasn't that level of disagreement. Uh, yeah, if you would never get unanimity, yeah. that's for sure. Um, to date, we've done 726 exams, and the results are pretty much the same as these. Um, we will have a quarterly update in a few weeks, and so therefore we'll, we'll know a little bit more. The uh, students are uh, satisfied because they are reporting to the student union that they are satisfied. The student union is not the slightest bit concerned, which is a nice um, treat in some ways because this is a very active student union and they are lobbying um, for all kinds of additional uh, supports to students. They like this. We like it. 
Um, we're in the only no the only known issues that we have come across that are of concern right now. Some reports that some invigilators are not always getting additional uh, time when issues arise. So if your internet connection drops for five minutes, they're not getting the extra five minutes. This is a process concern that can be addressed pretty easily. You think. There's a, a, a technical issue that the online exam system interprets the chat window as an exam breach and lots of students and student out. This has happened one or two times and we don't think it's a major thing. It seems to be a technical thing and um, they're working on fixing that. So the next step um, is a more fulsome analysis of the evaluation and then a presentation of those results to the faculty so that they can have an understanding as well. We'll consider the issues, identify anything new that rises, arises, and communicate the pilot results and then begin to roll this out a little bit more broadly. I would think that within the year, um, we will have many, many, many thousands of exams. We are not stopping the implementation while we consider the evaluation. There seems to be no evidence that we should. And that's it. That's all I can tell you at this stage. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Cindy. Yeah. Uh, Mark, my, my, uh, sorry, Rhiannon has uh, a question. Yeah, yeah, good question. Have you had any incidents of suspected uh, cheating or suspicious behavior, and how have those been covered? So they didn't report that to me. And I'm going to say that um, probably not. The students who have done this so far are students who are aware that this is a pilot. And so they have chosen to go into a, uh, a, a non-standard system. So we don't think so. But that's another piece of the evaluation that, um, that has, hasn't come to my attention at this stage. It just doesn't seem to be any worry, which is worrisome, actually. Um, so it's it's a question, and I'm to take the questions back as well. So I'll add that to my list of questions. So I'm assuming there's some sort of authentic or way to make sure that that's the authentic person. They have some sort of two I pieces of ID rule, or how do they something like that? that? Yes. Yes, we don't provide our students with ID cards the way a campus-based institution would. So we use the same authentication processes as we would use for anything else. Um, registration requires two pieces of ID. Like picture ID? Yeah. And signatures. Yeah, because when we do our students write individuated exams, for example, in the lower mainland, they have to show two pieces of that's ID, picture ID, it's scanned, you know, it's all authenticated. All the same processes, yeah. What's the, what's the delivery format here? Are they paper based or are they online? No, these are online. These are online. So they might be multiple choice, they might be short or long answer, They're, they would be all online. So is it, is it delivered through your system or do you give the exam over to Proctor? You give them to Proctor. They, they install them in your own. Now, whether that's a file that's provided, I'm not just sure about the technical yeah, okay. piece there. Maybe we upload them ourselves. I'm not sure. Okay. So do you have uh, unique instances of each exam once it's written, it's destroyed? Or do you no. reuse the same exam? We will reuse the same exam. But we have a set policy for a number of exams. Each course would have a certain number of exams. And they're recycled according to a formula that um, <coughs> isn't identifiable. <coughs> Same as we would do for a print-based environment. One, one last question, uh, Mark, can you hand up? Well, and, and then also, my understanding is you also use Procure, Mark. We've actually been using it for a couple of years, and I haven't had the best idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the, oh, but you're a graduate student, so this <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, so, so they, they, their, their uh, verification uh, process is Sure ideas, although that's that's one thing. But um, the, the, they'll ask you a series of questions through databases that are publicly accessible. Let's say which of these addresses is one that you've been associated with, or which of these counties or, or whatever have you lived in. The, the kind of several questions so that they know ultimately that it's you or your brother. I guess it could be also. Um, but it, it's it, it gets it down to uh, <coughs> you know pretty near certainty. 
Um, and, and ours is a little different in that um, we don't send the exams to Dr. Yu. Um, there's a sort of a separate uh, portal through which our exams are administered, and, and Dr. Yu simply watches the students. Uh, <coughs> the exam. There were the students required to have a webcam, um, speakers, and a microphone, that sort of thing, so that they can communicate with the person. But otherwise, uh, so maybe there are different models. That, that can and I could be wrong. I it's not <coughs> even that I'm speaking of. So I I could be completely wrong. It might be that, that they're coming to one of our services. They do seem to have different yeah. uh, approaches. So yeah. how, how much does this cost? Yeah. Uh, that was my point. That was going to be the, the point I was going to make, uh, make, which was for us, and, and we do quite a lot of volume of this. I believe not to again not to what you just said, but we we, we did it. Um, about 100,000 exams through wow. Dr. Yu last year. Okay. Um, and that allows us to get a rate that's, that's somewhat lower than the standard, but right. it's still $20, $23 US okay. for administration, which would be, it, 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 in this case, perhaps a pass along. But for now, we're, we're eating that ourselves, but right. uh, it may not last. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But it's not an exorbitant price. No. It's quite affordable for the service. Yeah. 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 And it's way less than what we would spend on the same process. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Right. And it's much more reliable than the in-person talking system that we use here, which I think is very similar, similar to yours. Yeah. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to invite Baker uh, to come and update us on an interesting prototype at uh, Clark of Poly. Okay. Okay. Do you want me to do that? Oh, so what we decided to do was try to figure out a way that we could take these micro courses on OERU and turn them into credit bearing courses. So here's what we did. We took an actual course called the Systems Approach to Sustainable Practice, which is 15 Ochaga Polytechnic course credits. It's the equivalent of about four US credits. It's exactly the equivalent to 16, actually. I have something extra on the screen. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, that's okay. Um, and we broke it into four micro courses. I'm going to stand over here so I have to turn around some more. Um, we broke it into four micro courses, each worth four credits. And total, uh, total added up equals the other course. Next. <laughs> okay, so. What the student can do is they can work their way. Did you trust her as the first one? They can work their way. You want this? That's it. Sorry. Okay. Uh, they work their way through each course as they like. Um, and part of each of these courses is the development of a portfolio, a reflective portfolio. I'm going to assume, based on the way we do things, uh, and I wasn't involved in this one, that it was against a strategic framework of some sort. So um, they don't have to be assessed to get the badge. They can just work themselves through the, these courses as they wish. But if they want to end up getting credit, they sign up to have their portfolio assessed. And they can have it assessed at two different levels, the last year of a bachelor's level and Two years before that. It's a different system in New Zealand. So in New Zealand, it's the first and, and third year, which is the final year of a bachelor's. Um, so what they do is they sign up, uh, they pay their fee, and then they have an opportunity to have their portfolio assessed. They can have all four of them assessed, and as they pass each one, they get a Mozilla Open Badge. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. <laughs> you can't read my brain. <laughs> when they finish the final one, they automatically get credits. They don't have to apply. So they pay before they get the badge? They pay for the badge. Whoa. They don't pay for the credit. So they're actually paying for this assessment the assessment service, yeah. which is mapped to credit. Can they get the badge without paying for the assessment? No. No. That's it counted to the badges. That's how we're doing it. Yeah. yeah, because they're paying the assessment. Yeah, I understand yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So you only get the four credits once you've gone through all of them. <coughs> you have to do all of them. That's correct. That's correct. And you have to do all four badges 
and then you're automatically okay. awarded the credit. So alternatively, could a student waste and just present the portfolio at the very end and get assessed on all four? They don't have to do the minimum. Okay. It's essentially the same thing. Whether yeah. they wait or do it separately. Yeah, that's right. Next slide. Next slide. <laughs> okay, so here's how here's the how behind it. Um, they take the course and then they decide that they want to have the badge, the recognition of learning. Before they can get the badge, they have to sign up for various services. Specifically, we use Skype to do the assessment because it's an in-person conversation about the portfolio. It's not an exam. That's probably why it costs something. Um, um, they pay through PayPal, and they have to sign up uh, for a Mozilla badge. So they have to establish Google accounts. Then they establish their identity in a very low-tech way, a selfie with their photo ID for now. The thing that's important about the way we've done this is we've separated out the functional blocks to be developed later if we decide to go into this in a big way. So after they set themselves up, then they pay the fee, they schedule an assessment time, and they have their site conversation um, to see whether they pass their assessment. If they pass it, well, if they don't, they can, you know, reschedule, they can re reset it. But if they do, then they get their badge. Yes. Go ahead. Yep. Is the student given the rubric as to what they're being assessed on? Yes. Yes, they are. You can in fact take a look at the rubrics um, online if you visit <laughs> the link to the course sites. Okay. Are they given the rubric during the process of creating the portfolio or just at the end of the process? Before. 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 Just okay. Okay, then after they earn all four badges, they might decide that they want credit towards their qualification. Then if they say they want credit, we enroll them and we give them the credit. That's all there is to it. We should be transferred credit. Transfer. Yeah, even if they've only done one course. No. They have to do all, all if they've done four, four, four badges all equals four, one four, course. Four, yeah, two course. So that is, that's the how, and these slides are on the OELU site if you have questions. What I'm hoping to do as the, the manager of the group that develops online learning is to identify courses as they're coming through to see which ones might work really well in this environment. And we see this as an actual, a pretty good strategic opportunity because it, it's a way of turning these open courses that we're all committed to producing anyway into something that can provide some income. We set this up as a very small pilot. We didn't expect to get very many students. We didn't advertise it. And just somehow, over 100 people <laughs> fell into this process. I'm not sure how many finished. So I think there's some potential. What about the, the, um, the benefit of micro credentialing over against completing a full course? I assume it would depend on the nature of the course and the learning material to look at what can actually lend itself towards micro in, in other words, breaking down something to the lowest possible unit level that makes sense. In some cases, you, you actually wouldn't want to do that because you would want students to have a more integrated understanding. Yes. In, in other cases, it could make sense to do it this way. Can you go back uh, one or two? Yes, we can do that. Thank you. One more. Yeah. So right here, what we're doing is we're assessing each one separately. But if you wanted to assess a whole course, you could have them complete the four micro courses and then do a more holistic assessment. Yeah. Um, yeah. You don't. You don't need to split it up like this. Yeah. Question from Pat. Yeah. This. This is actually a really nice little system. Because it's using open source, you're using everything that's available like in the cloud there, so you've got no big infrastructure costs. And I think it's really, really attractive. I see it being really attractive as part of a portfolio of testing, as you've yes. talked about. And it's picking up your point as well. Some of this is down to the micro credentialing. 
But that can fit. You can actually have, you can have a proctor, you can have some of this. If you have a, a toolkit of these assessment technologies, you can then use those when you're writing your courses. Yeah. The assessment. So that's one element of it. And that's, that's you know, there's a portfolio of tools you can use to assess. And the other important element of this as well is not getting caught up too much in the technology and this thing about trying to verify individuals. There are lots of different ways you can verify individuals. A lot of it you can do from even just the way you set the assessment up from the very start. So when you've got continual assessment and you're building on things, it's quite difficult sometimes for a student then to come in and cheat on one point. You can use random telephone vivas, which we've used for years. You know, you can you can see patterns of work with Turnitin. There are all sorts of ways. What we need to do is that the real success factor here will be combining some of those into an appropriate assessment regime for a particular course. And some courses you might be fine with just micro credentialing like this. Other ones, it might be they need to understand the entire course and then bring it together into a construct at the end. And that may be a different assessment. That's right. But that, I think, is very, very attractive and very cheap to do. Uh, I wouldn't say it's massively scalable, given yeah, the nature of the assessment. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's scalable from the sense that it's cost recovery, so um, you, you can outsource the labor required to make the model work. Yeah. And it's still cost effective. Yeah. Um, my understanding is that um, Mozilla had stopped supporting the Open Badges project, sure. um, oh, and then yeah, it's gone somewhere else. And then, and then yeah. so. so, do you know? Do you have folks at uh, Otago who are supporting this or, or developing this beyond what was? I'm sorry, I haven't been involved in the in the detailed level of this, but I can find out. So, so the short out. answer is it's a digital manifestation yeah. certifying <coughs> the basic infrastructure is adequate. But it's all open source. I mean, if this becomes yeah. something big in OERU, I mean, we're an open source yeah. shop. Yeah. Um, then we figure out how we support it. Because we were interested, but then when we heard it was. We had the same problem. We decided. The news travels very slowly. Yeah. But I mean, it makes sense to have this as part of the future discussion and have an OERU credential version because you need somewhere to store the record that, yeah. that people can actually then embed their badges. I think I think one of the beauties of this is that the assessment it is um, it is set up on the course itself to get the student prepared uh, with the portfolio, but the actual assessment is run by the institution. So you yourself can you can satisfy yourself that the student has met the requirements. Reggie, last question, and then we need to move on to the breakouts, and then one more question from Dave. I just want to ask, are students required to do the micro courses sequentially, or could they do micro course number four first of all? I think in this case that it's sequential. But, uh, you know, it depends on what you're offering. Mm -hmm. And as I said before, you can have them do all four and then do one holistic assessment, or you can have them do 20. You know, you can have them build a portfolio of evidence in any size that you want. In order to the particular course is designed that each micro is independent so they can do it in any sequence, this oh. particular one, yeah. Right. So, uh, I'm working with micro courses right now uh, in terms of trying to design one in this way, and I see the benefits for students in terms of giving them more flexibility. But I'm also seeing potential tension, especially if we are looking at whether it's Prop2U or any other assessment service, requiring them, for example, to pay multiple assessment fees every time we, we break it up in a micro course, as opposed to what might be a single assessment fee. For a, for a course that's not broken up. And I'm wondering about that that discussion or what the whole process is. You can handle this that way if you wanted to. You could have one badge for all four. You, it it becomes a learner choice then. Yeah. Right. And, and there are motivations for, particularly profession, you know, for professional development learning. Um, there are many folk who are not interested in the full credits, but they are interested in a component of this. So it's kind of serving a different market, but it's freedom of choice. So if the learner wants to do it that way, they can. Again, it will be a bit more expensive, but not significantly more. But they could just do the standard single assessment as well. I, I want to say one more thing. Uh, within the course, we've also been talking about a little button they can push if they want facilitation support. If they want to talk to someone in the middle of the course, they can arrange to pay the same way and set the time and, and get some assistance. I'm just thinking about this still. I mean, I get that you're saying that they have a choice, but I think at the same time, the structure of it itself is going to limit who actually has access to that choice. Sure. And so I'm, I'm, I think 
perhaps we need to seriously have a, a discussion about what the thought process about uh, why if, if it, why the, 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 the benefits of increased flexibility is then being limited to people perhaps um, who might need it the least in a sense. Uh, if the group that we're trying to serve the most um, has to pay the most in order to receive the greatest benefits, that's something I think we should be thinking about. But, but if you're talking price, you, you're effectively talking about 30% of the cost, or it's actually it's about 25% of the cost of the full credential cost. It's significantly cheaper. Just and against twenty yeah. percent, you know, if you're doing one assessment, you know, it's, it's those kind of levels. Yeah. Right. Look, I, I, I don't want to belabor this conversation. It's an important conversation. Don't, don't get me wrong. It's just that we don't have the time to finish the conversation. Um, what we need to do now is um, move into our breakout sessions and basically just start planning. Uh, Um, what I'm going to propose, uh, there, there's a section, a section here talking about um, thinking about learner recruitment and the injection of marketing credentials within the multi campaigns. You know, with individual institutional <coughs> offerings are actually injected into the information that is sent to learners through the automation process. So it's also all those registration details where you pay what other services are offered by the institution. Is there anyone here that is interested in talking about those uh, aspects of the, the marketing and recruitment? I'm, I'm, I'm happy to leave it there because that, that's a, a discussion we can take online uh, because I've had a suspicion that that might not be the area of uh, keen interest. Um, so, so I think we need to work with two groups. Uh, one is the the actual, uh, you know, implementing this credit transfer uh, for the MVP for the two uh, credentials. I mean, what are the steps we need uh, to carry out over the next couple of months uh, in order to, you know, get to where we need to be? I think that's one group, and, and at least the the Cert HE, Andy, and Brenda, you can be in those groups and you know help shape that conversation. Um, the second group is. Uh, Actually, doing a due diligence list. Of what are the things we need to get done? You know, other than sort of the credentialing piece for launching this first year of study. And what are the list of things that we have to tick off before we launch? So we can conceivably pick a date. The launch date is X. The other things that we need to get done. So those are the two groups. Just to get a rough indication, who is interested in joining Group One? Okay, that's viable. Group two? Okay, great. So that, those are two viable groups. So what I'm going to do is... I mean, be, before we do this, uh, um, um, following from our group yesterday, uh, um, I think as a group we need to know, are we going to go into this with a splash, or are we going to take a cautious approach? Like, Tabasco is done with the thing, and, and we're going to go in and test it out without any publicity, or are we going to just go in? So, uh, so that, or maybe that, have two launches one, the pilot, and then later on, have a big splash and get the marketing people and everything on. This, this is a very important question, I think. My own gut feel, my personal feel, it may, may not be carried by all. I think we must avoid the big splash approach. I think we should launch as a prototype, as an MVP prototype, make sure we've got everything working well before we do the big launch stuff. Um, you know, have a robust prototype in place and see how this works. And only once we have, you know, the proof of the pudding, do the big splash stuff. That is my sense, but I don't know what the general feeling is in the room. Is it oh, this is kind of going to be a bit uh, weird, but uh, is anyone who wants the big splash approach? Rory? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> Rory! <laughs> I want a big splash approach, but after we've done a pilot, yeah, okay. when we tell the students that it's a pilot, when you tell students it's a pilot, they're much more forgiving of the mistakes you make when you're starting up. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. So we are not, are you in group one or group two? Uh, I want to be in both, but uh, <laughs> now we're in group one. Yeah, I'll go to group two. Okay. Uh, so you've got the, 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 um, the key. Uh, the magic key. The magic key. key. Yeah. All right, so then we might group, group one in the other room you know, at, at the end because you've got the key to get in there because I've got no key to get in. I've got the key. Oh, have you got a key to get in? I'm in group one. Yeah. Okay, so we'll have group one in the other room, the big room on the end. And uh, group two, uh, the due diligence you know, the steps we need to take in here. And shall we uh, finish up at 25 past and then we can break for tea? That's correct? Yeah. 15 minutes. Uh, uh, not 25, uh, 25 two minutes, sorry. 25 two, just give us an extra five minutes into tea so we can just get these first draw of the points down. You're reading into our tea time. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll finish five minutes early, how's that? <laughs>